Hello, everyone. Welcome to our nature-based solution for water supply utility session. My name is Carmen G, and I'm a senior water specialist at the World Bank, currently based in Peru. The World Bank, together with the World Resource Institute, is hosting this event. And with the help of our partners, we have prepared a very interesting program. But before we begin, please note that this session has English and Spanish interpretation. And to have access to the service, you will need to download the interactive app. Hope, and I think you can find those instructions in the session um, introduction. Also, we will use the chat box for a Q&A. Feel free to post your questions throughout the session. In addition to the speakers, we also have other colleagues ready to answer your questions. Okay, so with that, just to let you know that I'm very excited about the recent spotlight that Nature Bay Solutions or NBS are having in recent years, in particular in the water and sanitation space and with water utilities. We are seeing more and more water supply infrastructure projects coupled with NBS components, standalone NBS projects designed to improve source water protection, as well as policies and research that enable these projects to become a reality. And there are many reasons why MBS is becoming popular. Let me just mention uh, four of these reasons. First is a cost-effective solution to boost water quality and regular, regulate seasonal flow, therefore enhancing water service delivery and building resilience of water supply and infrastructure to climate change. Second, MBS also help with climate change mitigation through avoiding carbon sources and enhancing carbon sinks. Studies show that natural climate solution has the potential to provide up to 37% of emission reductions needed by 2030. Third, MBS investments are also estimated to create 7% more jobs and stimulate 8% more economic activity than great infrastructure alone. As many um, countries embark in economic recovery, MBS provide an excel excellent opportunity to create jobs faster while also contributing to long-term green recovery. And the fourth one is reducing conflicts by building strong partnership with local communities. MBS has many benefits that we should see it as a superpower for water utilities. The business case of why we should all be working on MBS is there and the evidence is clear and it's actually well documented in the integrated green and gray report publication that the World Bank and WRI published in 2019. This report includes the advantage of better balances between green and gray infrastructure in projects that aim at improving water security. We will include the link of this publication in the chat box for your reference. But although we are making progress in the NBS in the water supply and sanitation sector, there is still a lot of more work on the implementation to ensure that NBS is routine and core part of water utilities. This is why the World Bank, also in collaboration with WRI, continues to work on a number of initiatives with government institutions and organizations to identify opportunities for NBS. As I mentioned, we want to focus on implementation and concrete examples of how NBS actually works. Therefore, in this session, we will highlight the experiences of water sector actors from distinct geography in planning projects that incorporate NBS to enhance service delivery and increase the resilience to different stressors. We will first start with Frodo van Ustvin, CEO of World Water Net International, who will share several practices, experiences in the implementation of MBS to improve water supply. This will be followed by Susan Osman, Senior Associate at the ORI, who will present the main findings and lessons of a study that looks at MBS project implemented by water utilities around the world. And the third and last presenter is, is Jan Martin Brown. He's a senior water specialist at the World Bank, 
who will present the case study of Guayaquil and Ecuador. We will share their bios in the chat box. This presentation will be followed by a panel discussion with the objective to share information on what is needed to move the needle and fully optimize the added value of better balances between green and gray. So for now, let me give the floor to Mr. Frodo Van Usvin so he can start with the presentation. Thank you and again, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Carmen. Thanks for this nice introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. Good morning. I would say good afternoon and a good evening for me here in the Netherlands. It's uh, past uh, 10 p.m. Uh, before I share my screen, uh, I will give a short background uh, about myself because my story about nature-based solutions will be about the, pow the power of collaboration and how all sectors can contribute. I think for myself, I've worked uh, within a corporate, within a bank, I work for social enterprise and NGO, and currently I'm uh, the director of the international part of World WaterNet, uh, a public water cycle organization in Amsterdam. Besides that, um, I love to swim. I love to swim in the river and I love to swim in the sea. So these kind of elements I will bring into the presentation uh, to hopefully inspire you and also to, uh, to trigger or to, uh, to raise some questions uh, afterwards. Um, Let me see. Is it working? That's a check because it's for me in my own bubble here. Um, Nature-based solutions, uh, it's, it's, it's about the ecosystem. I think what was mentioned before, we cannot do this alone. So let's, uh, let's all share forces and therefore ready. I'm, uh, I'm proud and uh, thankful to be part of this uh, session. So I think what we need, I think it's, it's inspiration from each other. Uh, so I think I visited the Amsterdam water dunes that are sort of filtering the drinking water provision for the city of Amsterdam for 75%. Um, I went on a journey with my colleague, Frank, as you can see here, by bike. Uh, it was a, quite a journey, uh, more than 20 kilometers on a bike. And I think that's what we all should do. And bring others with you in nature and inspire them. I think that's, that's for me the opening to, uh, to start with. Because uh, if we are aware of where we live and where we work and where we have our families, I think, and we look back at history, uh, then I think nature-based solutions isn't the question, then it's a way of living. So I think the same for the Netherlands, uh, what you can see here on the picture on the right. I don't know, so I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this was in the past, this was the sea, and now it's a lake. Yeah? What you can see here in blue is now land and was in the past a lake. So I think constantly in the years in the past, but also in the years to come, things will change. So instead of fighting with water, we are now living with water. What you can see on the left side is a map of Amsterdam around 1866. Uh, in that era, we thought about Golara that it was something that has to do with air quality. Eventually, we noticed that by research that it has to do with the quality of water. Uh, and during that era, in an era of industrial revolution, the topic of water became very important. So having the time era, the topic, and all these things should come together. And that probably makes also the business case. And it's not a one-dimensional business case, but I'll explain later that to you. This is probably a picture that you will know. The city of Amsterdam, blue, green infrastructure, uh, also constantly in development. You can see the north of the city is now also being developed more and more. Uh, I'm working for World WaterNet, and that's the sort of the international uh, foundation of WaterNet in which we have access to 2,000 colleagues that all have a passion for water cycle management, yeah, so integrated water resource management. It's quite a unique partnership, and we only exist for 15 years. We work together with the city of Amsterdam and the water authority Amstel, Gooi and Vecht. And together, we are WaterNet, and we manage the different parts of the water cycle, as you can see here. Um, Besides having the, sorry, the first footsteps here at your door, as you see on top of these pictures, it's a program called Rainproof. You can start tomorrow uh, by removing some uh, tiles out of your street, make it green, and then you have a nature-based solution in front of your door. There's nothing that will prevent you. You can do it with your kids. You can enjoy it. It's about education and awareness. But if you look in the bigger scheme, and this is really system thinking, uh, how a bigger si uh, city works, then you have to think about how the city of Amsterdam gets this water. So this is related to the river here in the south from the city of Utrecht 
and is pre-treated and then the river water goes to the Amsterdam dunes and for 75% is responsible for the city of Amsterdam and the surroundings for its drinking water supply. After post-treatment, so it goes through the dunes, the people of the city of Amsterdam will enjoy it. And it's a nature-based solution. The whole journey takes around 100 days. So it's also a patience game. Right? So you need to sort of uh, be aware that it's not easy. It's not plug and play. It takes time. And that's, I think, the friendship that we have with nature. I think looking behind the scenes, actually, it's more important what you don't see. So I think in the dunes, we collect and restore the groundwater. And it's a whole system. Also, that is not something that goes automatically. It's just wait, plug and play. My colleagues and partner organizations are constantly working day and night to check, to monitor, to involve young people, students. It's a constant process in which we measure the fresh water, the brackish and salt water to make sure that the system provides sufficient water for now and in the future. We have a whole roadmap in which you go through the whole process and people can follow it. And people can sort of go through the dunes every year. More than 2000 people go into the dunes and join with their family. I was there on my bike. And I met an elderly couple that was already 50 years walking through the dunes and sharing all kinds of stories about the beauty, how it's changed and how it eventually became more beautiful than it was before. And even now it became more and more, more important because it's also responsible for uh, good water and good drinking water. So it's responsible for the availability and you can follow the whole process. Uh, and also um, it's interesting because there's an elevation of nine meters so we use natural flows and processes, so we don't need energy and chemical processes to filter the water. But nobody said it would be easy. Yeah? So I think if you look on the left in the beginning, I thought this was the Suez Canal or something, but these are the Amsterdam dunes, uh, let's say 1850, uh, starting the whole process to make these canals and drains uh, to provide drinking water for the future. Um, it's also tricky. Huh? We need to sort of make sure that we know what we do. So it's a lot of research that's going on to make the whole system working. So my colleague explained about where they measure and if they measure that the measure is not hundred huh, percent because the day after it can be different. So it's, it's a way of huh, having a passion for what's going on in the system. It's also, huh, I think that's one of the questions also for today, it's a, it's a business case. So a triple bottom line, it has a social value, an environmental value, and of course a financial value, because we can sort of live there and we stay dry. On the left side, you can see uh, the sea. Uh, so it's coastal defense. Yeah. It's, it's people that can enjoy nature. It's drinking water provision. It's the beauty of nature. That's all in this Amsterdam water dunes. So what would I like to sort of give with you? I think everything we do has different stakeholders. And for every step we take are different conflicts of interest. So the key thing is to stay in touch with each other, to have a dialogue, to be on the same platform, because everything has a different value for each other. Uh, so stay in a dialogue. Um, I think involve young people. Uh, measure, learn, involve NGOs, universities, and so forth. It's the power of collaboration. Um, and you will see the system is dynamic. It's never finished. And I think that's sometimes hard also with a lot of engineers around me. You would like to have it sort of black and white. Eh? It's, it's, it's figures. It's, it's constantly be creative, be curious to see what's going on. So stay alert and be surprised. Look behind the facts. And also learn about history. Eh? What has been going on in that sort of river system, in that watershed for the last 50 or maybe 100 years? Because nature will tell you. Uh, I would about say I will still stay quiet for a bit, but also due to time, I think I need to sort of hurry up a bit. Uh, but this is the beauty. Nature thrives and it becomes more beautiful uh, every day, I would say. But it, all these things will not go by themselves. So what we have used uh, in the years, and that's something also with the international part that I'm responsible for, is to exchange knowledge with other countries and with other river systems, other cities, other um, ecosystems. So it's about leadership. Yeah, so I think we as a community of nature-based solutions, it's about leadership. Dare to make this step. It's not an easy step, but I think it's worthwhile fighting for. So um, especially with climate change and all these things that are changing, find equity, find partners that you can work with, find diversity. I think that's the crucial part. Make sure you measure it. Yeah, so think in dashboards, but don't trust the dashboards as a uh, sort of cruise control because things will change. 
And the last bit is the sustainability, the, 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 the business case on three elements that I mentioned before. Um, we have worked in over 30 projects and uh, every time we try to include nature-based solutions. We have worked in China on artificial recharge. We're doing some work in Burkina Faso. Uh, we worked with sponge cities, I think all famous concepts. Uh, and currently we are starting a project in Ghana uh, in which we have allocated the focal point for nature-based solutions. Those nature-based solutions, they, they need an owner, right? they need an ambassador, somebody who works day and night for nature-based solutions. Because at the end of the day, it's always in silos. And I think that's something that's uh, that's important. So I'm looking forward to share later more updates on, uh, on Ghana as well. And just to breathe a bit and also to save time maybe and to uh, sort of hand it over to my uh, to my next speaker, I'm looking forward to, uh, to her story as well, Suzanne. Um, please contact me because I think I do not have the solutions for everything, but by having these questions and sharing these questions together, I have access to a community of nature-based uh, solutions providers, colleagues, water cycle experts, and I think that's for me the starting point. I don't see this as a finish, but hopefully I can stay in touch with all of you. And if you have questions, please reach out to me. Thanks. Hi everyone, are you hearing me? Yes. And seeing my slides, I hope? Yes, okay, Frodo confirmed. Thank you Frodo for kicking it over to me. Uh, everyone, I, I hope that, please say something if the slides are not displaying properly. Uh, I'm Suzanne Osment from WRI and I'm delighted to be here today to share with you about our work with the World Bank uh, to support the adoption of nature-based solutions for water supply. Uh, in this work, we've met with World Bank staff and clients from over 15 locations worldwide uh, to do two things. One, to support them in identifying and preparing uh, nature-based solutions that help achieve water security, and also to understand their needs uh, and uh, understand what's going to ease the integration of green and gray infrastructure going forward. You know, I've been in the nature-based solutions field of some sort for over a decade. And I think through this project in particular, we're getting much more granular about what the integration of green and gray looks like in practice and what it needs to look like in order to really scale. Uh, let's start with uh, why the World Bank teams are considering this. Carmen and Frodo, I think already covered very well the many benefits to the water sector that nature-based solutions can provide. Uh, what we've heard from World Bank teams is that by extending the menu of options available to their clients, and, and by clients, I mean mainly in this case, uh, water utilities and government agencies, it is really adding value, especially in the context of economic recovery uh, from the pandemic, where we need to build back better and on a tight budget. Um, for sake of time, because this has been covered, I'll, I'll go on. Um, let's see. So we were able to take a rapid review of parts of the World Bank portfolio. It was not comprehensive, but even so, we identified that since, uh, since 2018, the World Bank has approved 36 projects that include nature-based solutions for water. And so the adoption within the World Bank is growing. Um, there's also a pipeline of nature-based solution projects under preparation, working towards approval. And so I think we can expect that number to grow even more. Some projects where we explored nature-based solution opportunities that were in uh, the, the project development phase are listed here. And the next speaker, Jean-Martin Brout, will speak about the case from Guayaquil uh, from this project. We've taken a look at where nature-based solutions should be incorporated within the project preparation cycle. And the general rule of thumb is that earlier is better, um, especially to make adequate space for the consideration of nature-based solutions down the line. Um, these solutions do require often more time to prepare well other than uh, traditional infrastructure. And so earlier is better. But because nature-based solutions are often left out of the earliest discussions, uh, World, World Bank task teams have identified opportunities throughout the project cycle to fit in nature-based solutions in many ways. And we've been able to map how the standard World Bank uh, project preparation process, 
Sorry, I just got an error message. It's funny. Okay, apologies. Um, as I was saying, so we've, we've actually mapped out how the World Bank project preparation process can create integration points for nature-based solutions uh, so that this can be made more routine. Um, to be considered on par with uh, traditional infrastructure, it's really important to uh, rigorously evaluate and carefully design nature-based solutions. Um, until recently, that was not always the case. That has often not been the case. Um, but clear guidance on how to do that is, is now more available than ever. And the work that WRI and the World Bank have done over this past year focuses on putting existing knowledge and guidance into practice. Uh, and so we found there's five main feasibility factors to consider in project preparation um, pictured here. Now, in my view, most of the attention over the past several years has gone towards uh, the technical and financial and economic analysis, which I think makes sense as an entry point. You know, it's important to uh, understand the technical feasibility first. And the nature-based solutions community has made good progress on how to go about assessing these aspects of the project. But interestingly, many of the World Bank teams and clients that we spoke to were uh, more interested or, or lacking guidance on what to do around the social, institutional, and legal uh, feasibility for their project. And these dimensions, they have to do with how these projects will be implemented on the ground in a fair way over many years into the future. So this is where general tools and guidance for a global audience becomes less useful. Uh, and it's important to rely on local analysis and sustained multi-stakeholder engagement to make these projects work well. Um, as one example of where we've applied this feasibility framework, uh, we worked uh, supporting the government of Turkey and the World Bank task team on their project, Resilient Landscape Integration Project. And uh, the team has identified nature-based solutions that will support local water security goals, as well as carbon sequestration and rural livelihoods. And they're now working to forge new institutional partnerships among four distinct implementing agencies, hydraulic works, forestry, agriculture, and highways. So you can imagine the complexity, but because of the benefits that nature-based solutions provide, it's necessary to pilot this collaborative interagency engagement to facilitate uh, the implementation of the project. So to sum it up, um, you know, I, I would say that the World Bank has invested in knowledge and experience to bring the solution set to its clients. The next move, I hope, would be from the water utilities and national and subnational governments to bring uh, nature-based solution project ideas to the bank or to other partners I think they'll have a willing and ready partner at the bank. Um, there's also some things that the broader community of water stakeholders can do to support this movement better. Um, some needs emerged from this work, one being that while there's tools and guidance on technical and economic feasibility assessment, we need better data uh, to improve uh, those, those assessments. And so monitoring and evaluation is key. I'd say additionally, more guidance and insights on how to facilitate institutional coordination and effective and fair community engagement are still needed. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. And I will hand it over to Jean Martin from the World Bank. Thanks, Suzanne. Let me uh, share my screen. Right. So hi, um, hi everybody. My name is, is Jean-Martin Bro. I'm a senior water and sanitation specialist at the World Bank, and, and I'll be presenting um, the, the results of a, a study conducted by uh, the WRI in, in Guayaquil, Ecuador, uh, to identify opportunities to implement nature-based solutions uh, for water security and resilience. Um, it's worth mentioning that we're, uh, we were working there already with the utility, uh, the municipal utility called EMAPAG. Uh, we have a, about a $300 million infrastructure project focusing currently on, on wastewater collection and treatment. So we saw this as an opportunity to, to broaden the scope a little bit and, and address 
uh, some of the, 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 the resilience aspects uh, or, or increased resilience of the infrastructure and also address the, the more the broader objective of water security in, in this area. Um, first, a little bit of, as, a con, as context, um, Guayaquil is a, a 3 million people uh, city in, in, the, in this part of the Ecuador, you can see on the map. And it's, it needs about a million uh, cubic meters per day of water. And it relies heavily on uh, one of the two smaller watersheds, let's say, that are shown on the picture here in the middle. Um, this, the, the Rio Dauli watershed is critical for drinking water supply, and it's also the sole source, or currently the sole source of, of drinking water for Guayaquil. Um, and there are two challenges that Guayaquil is facing right now, challenges to, to its water security. Uh, one is related to water quality deterioration, um, mainly due to erosion or, or sediments uh, coming from the upstream uh, Dauli River. Um, and then we also have, it's a highly agricultural uh, area uh, upstream of the city, so you have the, the issue of agrochemicals, and you also have a lack of wastewater collection and treatment upstream, as well as in the city of Guayaquil, uh, partly addressed by, by one of our projects there. Um, the second challenge is related to, um, to hydrometeorological disasters, uh, such as floods, intense rains, and, and droughts. Um, and the most recent flood actually was in 2021, and there was quite a bit of damage, and you can see in, in the picture uh, below. Um, and it's worth mentioning as well that um, Guayaquil is about four meters above the, um, the sea level. And when there are intense rains uh, combined with the tide, uh, you can the water level can reach uh, up to, to 3.5 meters. Uh, so it, it's getting very close. Uh, you're also clogging the stormwater uh, spillways that are connected to the river, uh, and it's plugging the drainage system. So it's creating quite a uh, chaos, let's say, for the city. Um, so, so with that in mind, I mean, the, the stakeholders in Guayaquil, they recognize the, the importance of, of, of thinking outside the box or, or doing a non-business as usual, uh, in, let's say, a way of, of, of tackling these issues. And so they know that they need to find an adequate balance between gray and, and green alternatives to, to guarantee uh, the robustness, the cost effectiveness, and the resilience of their, of their systems. And so we went with this in mind, we went into the, the study with the WR. Um, and, and looked at uh, the types of nature-based solutions that could be implemented uh, and, to, and the types of benefits now that we could get from those. Um, and it was decided to focus after uh, discussing with uh, EMAPAG, the utility, as well as with the, the water fund, uh, the Fondagua, that includes EMAPAG, but other key stakeholders as well, um, to look at the protection of water sources to address the quality issue I mentioned. Uh, that's upstream, um, as well as to work um, upstream, as well as in the urban environment to tackle erosion and flood management. And uh, as well in the urban environment, look at wastewater treatment, uh, meaning if we can incorporate, construct the wetlands into the, the treatment train uh, to, to help uh, improve efficiency of treatment and or reduce operating costs. Um, and so the results of, of the study conducted by the WRI um, um, led to uh, five recommendations. Um, the first one is, um, since there was uncertainty about the potential for, 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 for benefits, let's say that these solutions could provide, at least in the, with the stakeholders we were discussing, um, I think uh, Suzanne mentioned that there was a, a lack of solid data um, and there was a lack perhaps of, of other use cases or successful history of, of cases that could convince them no, that, that uh, to change their perception of, of, of nature-based solutions. So with that uncertainty and the lack of data, one of the recommendations is to, is to connect the data that is currently being generated on water quality indicators. This is through the SICA uh, monitoring network that we're financing through our project. Uh, connect those with land use indicators so that we can demonstrate the connection between um, uh, NBS and, and water quality. Um, the second recommendation was to, um, to promote a business case study or, or promote the development of a business case study or a green gray assessment 
to solidify the value pro proposition of NBS. Um, this is because the main actors, let's say Emapag and, and the Fondagua, they've already managed to convey in, in more of a theoretical way the, to a large number of actors the, the, the importance of investing in NBS, but they haven't, uh, it has, that hasn't been sufficient to meet, let's say, uh, commitments or to, or to generate financial resources enough. And so I think the suggestion was what, that we should go into this, this case study um, or the development of this assessment. And then the third recommendation was to undertake um, a legal feasibility analysis um, to, for the, for a scope or for the, the breadth of financial mechanisms uh, that were evaluated as part of that study. The mechanisms that were evaluated were avoided costs, uh, municipal special improvement comp contributions, uh, green taxes or, or tariffs, and then environmental taxes that are supporting the polluter pays principle. Uh, and then the, the fourth recommendation is to, to develop sort of a feasibility study for, for the most appropriate design of, of uh, nature-based solutions that could be part of the um, one of the wastewater management systems that we're supporting under our project called the Los Merinos uh, system. Um, and there were two ideas here. Um, one was to, to work on mangrove restoration and preservation to, to protect the infrastructure. Uh, and improve its resilience because the, the wastewater treatment plant is uh, on the shores of, of, uh, of, the, of the river and is one of and is flood prone. Um, and then the other idea was to incorporate constructed wetlands into the treatment train to help reduce operating costs. Um, and then the fifth and final uh, recommendation was to continue with what's already been in, uh, already in place, let's say the the the, in, the inter institutional cooperation efforts that were we saw uh, that are there between Emapag, but also the, the the water fund Fondagua, other key allies in the city as well, uh, and and continue to expand this, uh, and all of this these five recommendations is to, is to really to to help build uh, resilience and and continue to 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 strengthen water security in the in the Dalde River Basin and and for the city of Guayaquil, and I think. Uh, for us, it is particularly interesting to have been able to work with uh, a client that is open to these ideas. Uh, you know, the, the proverbial champion that we all always aim to to work with. Uh, I think we have we have them there. Uh, but it's uh, but I think for me the key takeaway is that we started with a wastewater uh, collection and treatment uh, project, and now we're we're, by incorporating nature-based solutions and that new thinking, we're really transforming this into a, a water cycle project almost. And so I think this is a very important and very beneficial for, for the client as well. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Jan Martin, Susan, and Frodo for the excellent presentations. I encourage all of the participants to post your questions in the chat box. And uh, continuing with the program, let's move to our high level panel discussion on the biggest challenges and emerging solutions facing the inclusion of NBS in water projects. And to do that, a card gardener will moderate this panel. Todd is the director of Cities and Forests and the Natural Infrastructure Initiative at WRI. Over to you, Todd. Thank you, Carmen. Um, wonderful session so far and excited to moderate the panel with three excellent speakers. As Carmen mentioned, we're going to focus on the opportunities and the challenges, a specific focus on financing and lessons learned from NBS water related projects in the Netherlands, in Peru and in parts of the United States. So quick introductions of our panelists. First, we have uh, Raven Lawson, who is the Watershed Protection Manager at Central Arkansas Water. Uh, her team is responsible for protecting, enhancing, restoring watershed lands of the utilities to drinking water reservoirs, which provide municipal water for over a half million residents in Arkansas. And they've led on some really innovative financing and partnership approaches. We're fortunate today to have Ivan Luchik, uh, who is the executive president of the National Superintendents of Sanitation Services, SUNAS, in Peru. Uh, Ivan previously served as the manager of policies and regulations and manager of tariff regulations of SUNAS. So brings a wealth of practical academic and regulatory experiences 
to the discussion. And finally, we're fortunate to have Frodo uh, rejoin us uh, after his initial comments, providing some more insights from his experience in the Netherlands. Uh, Raven, I I'd like to please start with you. Uh, Central Arkansas water in the Southeast US has been a leading water utility on green gray infrastructure approaches. I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about your utilities source water protections efforts, really how you finance that work in an attempt to get to a meaningful ecological scale. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. Uh, yeah, so I'll start off by saying that we have two watersheds from which we supply our water. But one is definitely more of our focus um, when we're talking about nature-based solution efforts, as the other one is kind of tucked away in a national forest. So the one you'll hear me reference most is the Lake Maumelle watershed. It's 88,000 acres and it has an 8,900 acre reservoir, which supplies two thirds of our daily demand for those half million uh, people. We place our focus here, uh, due to the immediate development threats with the suburban expansion of the state's capital city reaching out into the watershed. To date, our source water protection efforts have been focused heavily on fee title acquisition of lands, conservation easements, and the restoration and active forest management on those lands that we own. And those lands that we own currently total more than 14,000 acres of forest lands. Uh, we've been able to do this because our watershed protection fee uh, which is paid for by our rate payers, um, has been well established. It's a per meter per month fee that currently produces a little over $2 million annually. We adopted the fee in 2008 uh, upon recommendation by our resident led and rate payer stakeholders who are part of our watershed management planning process in 2006 and seven. So the product of that process was our Lake Maumel watershed management plan which tasked the utility with purchasing 1,500 acres of land to offset potential development by current landowners. But we kept going. <laughs> and as of just last week, we've been able to put over 5,000 acres of watershed lands under permanent protection using those funds generated from the fee. This past October, we were able to leverage those funds to obtain the world's first green bond for the purchased forest lands as water infrastructure. This was a nearly $32 million green gray bond with six and a half million dollars specifically for land purchases. We're hoping that we can further leverage the green bond monies and use them as matching funds and turn that money into two or three times that amount for purchasing lands. So this really gives us great advance in putting nature-based solutions to scale across the watershed landscape. Thanks, Raven. I, I love the green gray financing approach and that you were able to leverage rate fees by tap, then tapping into the private market with the green bond. So definitely want to come back to that as we move forward. Uh, Raven gave us sort of the practitioner's point of view. Now, Yvonne, um, your role as a regulator is clearly quite different, um, but you play a critical role to ensure that the Peruvian NBS policy for water supply and sanitation linked to water utilities can operate effectively. Please tell us a little bit about that NBS program, how it's funded and what the role of the regulator is to make sure it works as planned. Bien, eh, muchas gracias, Todd. Um, en, en Perú, el programa de pago por servicio ambiental es una política pública que se implementa a través de una ley que se llama la Ley de Mecanismo de Retribución por Servicios Ecosistémicos. Eh, esta política y esta ley se aplican al sector de agua potable y saneamiento y establece lo siguiente, que todas las empresas de agua, que son empresas de gestión pública, deben celebrar acuerdos con las comunidades campesinas para conservar las fuentes de agua desde donde se provee el recurso hídrico que sirve a estas empresas para luego potabilizar el agua y abastecerla a los, a los usuarios en las ciudades, ejecutando proyectos de conservación y o restauración sobre los ecosistemas que serán financiados 
eh, con la tarifa de agua que pagan los usuarios en la ciudad. Esta eh, ley eh, también establece que las empresas de, de agua como retribuyentes y las comunidades campesinas como contribuyentes del servicio ecosistémico deben conformar plataformas para la buena gobernanza de este mecanismo y mantener las intervenciones. Además, esta ley establece algunas funciones para el regulador. Eh, antes de pasar a, a, a detallar estas, eh, 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 este rol que tiene el regulador, es importante eh, definir que el mecanismo de retribución consiste en que los usuarios de los servicios de agua potable aportan un monto de dinero a través de su recibo de agua para financiar los proyectos de conservación y restauración de los ecosistemas, ¿no? Eh, eh, de la, desde donde las empresas eh, se proveen del recurso hídrico. Y también, y esto es muy importante, para financiar el costo de oportunidad en que incurren las comunidades para conservar y restaurar las fuentes. El rol que tiene SUNAS como organismo regulador son básicamente tres. El primero es brindar asistencia técnica a los operadores, que son las empresas de agua potable, para poder identificar los proyectos de conservación o restauración de los ecosistemas, ¿no? Eh, eh, y, y esto va a permitir que las empresas puedan obtener o más agua en época de estiaje o un agua de, de menor calidad con menos sedimentos para poder ser potabilizada. En segundo lugar, el regulador debe incorporar en la tarifa de agua potable los costos de estos proyectos de conservación, así también como el costo de oportunidad que mencioné antes. Y en tercer lugar, la SUNAS tiene que fiscalizar el uso adecuado de este dinero para que efectivamente se vaya a la conservación. Bueno, inicialmente nosotros habíamos eh, eh, considerado eh, eh, como monto a, a retribuir por los ecosistemas el 1% eh, de la facturación o un dólar por conexión. Actualmente estamos desarrollando estudios para poder eh, determinar este monto a pagar en función de los costos que se evitan a las empresas eh, de agua. Gracias, Iván. And it's really interesting to hear you refer to the tariff structure. There's some similarities to what Raven talked about in terms of the rate surcharge. Um, Frodo, sort of building on, on those comments from Raven and Iván, Uh, thinking about Dutch leadership over the last century in terms of flood control and using nature for, uh, for water resource benefits writ large, in order to enact these types of tariffs and rate surcharges, we need to make the business case. In your earlier presentation, you mentioned the triple bottom line. Um, how do you continue to make that economic imperative in the business case to Dutch decision makers, especially in times of tough budgets in the face of COVID recovery. Would love to hear what you've learned and what you might share for others. Uh, thanks, Todd. And thanks for the others for um, interesting thoughts already. And I think there is no one solution uh, for everything. Uh, but I think the reality is that we need to adapt. Uh, so I think it's, it's a constant thing as climate change adaptation is, is required. And I think the, the key of no action at the cost of doing nothing are higher than do something. And that's always a hard thing yeah? because then you talk about prevention and adaptation and that's normally follows. But I think nowadays we see a lot and I think over the last weeks, even in the Netherlands and Germany and Belgium with a lot of floods going on, if you see the cost of no action yeah? or hey, what you can prevent, and that's also the question, yeah? the cost of prevention. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's constantly adapting and I think we, improved i think the last 10 years was the last flood that was occurring we did better than last time is that a guarantee for the next one we're not sure but at least we try to learn and try to improve what we can um, so in that way we try to include nature-based solutions in policies indeed eh, what the previous speaker was mentioning but that's not a single solution so i think it's it's a hybrid way of working as part of education to make sure that young people already have these sort of triple bottom line business case in their education. Uh, and it's, I think in the Netherlands, it's quite common to have a platform for collaboration in which NGOs, universities, private sector and public sector are working together. 
And I think that's for me the path forward. And that's what we try to sort of, uh, as, and therefore I think sometimes things are not going so fast. Uh, and sometimes you need different organization for managing a crisis or looking ahead. And I think that's that's what we try to do as much as we can. Yeah, that, that's excellent, Frodo. And, and Raven, maybe same question for you, right? Preventing bad stuff from happening is really uh, Central Arkansas Water's you know, theory of change. How have you been able to make the business case and who did you have to make that case to? Was it the board, the ratepayers, others? Please help us understand what that process looked like. For sure. Um, so how we've been able to do it is we have created a strong storyline behind viewing our forested and non-forested watershed lands around those source waters as utility infrastructure. Uh, once we had a good understanding for the various ecosystem services and benefits, we paralleled that to our gray infrastructure in a number of different areas throughout the utility for the benefits of both our board and our internal staff. Uh, a lot of our biggest first hurdle was getting our current um, employees educated on the subject. Uh, from there, it really hasn't been a hard sell. Uh, after all, it was the ratepayers who initially came to us with the idea of that watershed protection fee that I talked about already. Um, and once we had purchased that 1,500 acres that the plan told us to do, it was our job to just keep furthering that storyline and showing that the protection of moorlands only lengthens the lives of our water supply reservoirs. And that's a timeline we've continuously pushed out since they were built in the 1930s and 1950s. When you look at the water quality data, you're able to keep extending that timeline out for 100 years at a time. And this allows the utility to keep treatment costs low. It prevents the associated cost of having to completely change water sources. The return on investment for purchasing and managing these landscape looks very favorable to the alternative, which is allowing them to be heavily developed. Um, the, we have models that show how that development would quickly truncate the time frame and diminish our water quality that we currently have. So in today's dollars and with other challenges, building the infrastructure to pull water from somewhere else is extremely costly and often not a favorable solution, uh, whether it be for environmental or political reasons. So the story of simply being able to extend the usable life of our reservoirs through land protection has really gone a long way. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I love how you've been able to sort of show uh, what those future costs would be in, from an inaction perspective. Yvonne, we heard from Frodo and from Raven about what the economics look like in the US and Europe. I suspect it might be quite a different case in Peru. Um, how have you thought about the cost savings of protecting and restoring these watersheds? And how did that fit in to the development of the NBS policy in Peru? Sí, gracias. Efectivamente, Todd. El, el propósito de, de, de aplicar la ley de mecanismos de reclusión por servicios ecosistémicos para el sector de agua potable es evitar que se trasladen sobrecostos a los usuarios de los servicios de saneamiento a través de mayores tarifas. ¿no? Y esto es como consecuencia de los impactos que genera la degradación ambiental sobre el sistema de captación de agua cruda y también sobre el proceso de tratamiento de agua potable. Estos impactos podrían ser de varios tipos, por ejemplo, la paralización de las operaciones de las plantas potabilizadoras, sea porque falta agua, porque se deteriora su infraestructura, por el lavado de filtros, ¿no? También, digamos, hay una repercusión en el empleo de mayores insumos químicos para potabilizar el agua, sobre todo cuando está ya con muchos sedimentos, altos niveles de turbidez, como consecuencia del arrastre de lodos y el propio desabastecimiento de agua a la población, ¿no? Que genera sobrecostos porque los usuarios tienen que buscar fuentes alternativas y las empresas también no pueden dejar desabastecida una población más de 24 horas. De esta manera, eh, eh, en la aplicación de la ley del mecanismo para el sector de agua potable eh, eh, básicamente tiene eh, como propósito eh, trasladar los costos. ¿no? los costos, los sobrecostos a través de la tarifa 
a los usuarios. Nosotros como organismo regulador somos conscientes que todo lo que ocurre en la cuenca abastecedora repercute en los costos del servicio. Es por eso que so estamos interesados en que las empresas de agua controlen la cadena de suministro de su principal insumo, que es el recurso, es el recurso hídrico. Más aún cuando eh, quien, digamos, eh, eh, debe explicar a los usuarios, debe rendir cuentas a los usuarios cuando falta el agua, es la empresa, es la empresa, es el operador. Entonces es natural que éste participe en la gestión de cuencas, en los consejos de, de recursos hídricos. Gracias, Iván. And let me, let me stay with you. Uh, really impressive that over $30 million has been allocated to the NBS program. How is the rollout going? And how, when you, how will you know when you've been successful? Ivan, that one for, for you, please. Um, with the over $30 million allocated, how will you know when that has been successful? Sí. Eh, cor correcto. Este, sí, efectivamente, eh, a la fecha se ha logrado aprobar más de 30 millones de dólares para ejecutar proyectos de, de conservación en eh, las cuencas abastecedoras de, de 40 empresas de agua en el Perú. Eh, actualmente se viene ejecutando con estos recursos 15 proyectos de conservación. En algunas microcuencas, eh, eh, como aquellas que abastecen de agua a la ciudad del Cusco o a la ciudad de Abancay, ya contamos con resultados eh, concretos y básicamente en haber logrado mayores eh, caudales, ¿no? Y esto básicamente con, con medidas que pueden ser tan simples o tan complejas como, por ejemplo, eh, establecer cercos perimétricos en eh, los bofedales, eh, realizar zanjas eh, de in, in, infiltración y, y también, digamos, los procesos de, de reforestación con, con especies eh, nativas, ¿no? Ahora, estos logros eh, han sido posibles, creemos nosotros, por, por dos factores, ¿no? Uno es el hecho que la ley establece que todas las empresas de agua están obligadas a incorporar un monto de la retribución para ejecutar proyectos de conservación. Pero el segundo factor que creemos que nosotros, que creemos nosotros que es más importante que, que la propia ley es la voluntad de las empresas y sobre todo la voluntad de las comunidades campesinas en poder gestionar de manera adecuada sus recursos hídricos y no darle la espalda a las cuencas abastecedoras, ¿no? Digamos, ante estos dos eh, eh, requerimientos, la SUNAS en cumplimiento del mandato de, de la ley ha establecido una estrategia. La, 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 la principal es la de poder involucrar a las empresas prestadoras de agua en el conocimiento de sus cuencas y sobre todo involucrarlas en relaciones comunitarias con la población que gestiona los recursos hídricos en los ecosistemas, sin ese involucramiento, por más ley que tengamos, no se puede avanzar. Y el segundo aspecto es concientizar al usuario de la ciudad, ¿no? A través de su recibo de agua, que está realizando un pago para la conservación de las fuentes eh, de agua, ¿no? Eh, es importante mencionar que en los espacios donde hemos intervenido, ya existía, ya venían operando distintas plataformas eh, eh, multiactor en torno a la problemática del agua. ¿no? Eh, eh, y esto es muy, muy importante. O sea, eh, eh, la población ya venía de alguna u otra manera discutiendo la problemática. Lo que hace el diseño de mecanismos de retribución es, es vincular a estas plataformas existentes con un esquema que va a
permitir canalizar esfuerzos y también recursos económicos desde las ciudades urbanas a el ámbito rural. Y esto no solamente permite resolver el problema eh, de la conservación para tener una un mayor flujo y calidad del agua, sino sobre todo contribuye a mejorar las condiciones de vida de las poblaciones que están en estos ecosistemas, tanto a través de lo que es el saneamiento básico rural, como también a partir del de costo de oportunidad que cubrir este costo de oportunidad en que incurren eh, estas, eh, esta población. ¿no? Eh, ahora, eh, es, es, es para, para, para finalizar, digamos, quiero decir que el éxito se alcanza, creemos nosotros, cuando las empresas de agua y, y las comunidades logran los acuerdos para un acceso equitativo y, y gestión eficiente del agua. Lo demás son aspectos técnicos, institucionales, legales, para poder viabilizar los procesos. Gracias. Gracias, Iván. Raven, in, in the last 45 seconds of this part of the session, What is the one piece of advice you might have for other water utilities looking to replicate Central Arkansas water success? Oh, you might be on mute. And so the one piece of advice that I would give other water utilities is to start that stakeholder engagement early. Get your ratepayers involved, get the watershed residents involved. Um, Our watershed residents and our ratepayers were involved even before our watershed management plan was ever adopted. They actually got to make the decision whether we move forward with creating that plan and going into an in-depth study. So we had buy-in from them from the very beginning. When they were part of that process before it was ever a thing, um, they urged us to go forward. And without that core stakeholder group, we wouldn't have our watershed protection fee and we wouldn't have our green bond, and we wouldn't be able to leverage money in order uh, to reach our goal of protecting over 70% of our watershed. That's excellent. Raven, thank you so much. Yvonne, Proto, really appreciate your comments and, and insights. Uh, to wrap up the panel, it's my pleasure to introduce Irene Rayberger, who is a water resource management specialist at the World Bank, currently focused in the African region. Irene, please help us wrap this session up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Todd. It's a pleasure to, to be part of this session. And what I wanted to highlight uh, as um, kind of like capturing this session is that the case of Guayaquil is not uncommon. There are many cities around the world and are for sure our 74 attendees uh, are aware of this that face a uh, water security challenges or either too much water or too little or too dirty. So uh, what we need to start thinking is uh, think outside the box and integrate the type of solutions that were mentioned here today. For example, as Prodo mentioned, the sand dunes uh, that help uh, filter and, and, and retain water, or as Jan Martin uh, mentioned, the, the, the new solutions that the Guayaquil uh, utility is exploring at the coastal, urban, or upstream level. So the resilience of the city uh, can uh, increase and the water security improve. We also heard of other solutions such as tariffs um, from uh, Ivan. Uh, so what I want to invite everyone is just like this note of excitement that I have after the session is to when, when they engage in new projects, when they engage in new initiatives to start um, thinking or have the, in the back of their minds the nature-based solution work so they can integrate it with the, with the with the gray approaches that they are very familiar with as, as uh, Raven mentioned for the central Arkansas. So with this, and, and why? <laughs> Because it's cost effective and it brings co-benefits for the communities and for the environment. Uh, so with this, I, I really want to thank everyone. It has been a pleasure to participate and, and, and to learn from you all. Uh, over to you, Carmen, for, for closing. Thank you. No, that's it, folks. Thank you all on behalf of the World Bank and the WRI. Thank you for all the speakers, the panelists, and for all the participants. We all look forward to continue the dialogue on MBS for water utilities and working with you to mainstream this fabulous solution. Thank you. Bye-bye.